I'm uh, really delighted to be here, and I'm really especially excited that the students are here in the front row. Um, I, I love what I do. Uh, my lab is here at the University of Chicago, but really it extends to North and South Poles. Uh, I'm a dreamer. Where you might see a cliff, I see an ancient river. I wonder about the bones of animals that have never been seen. 65 million years ago, there was a catastrophe that uh, Meave mentioned that changed the course of evolution on the planet. Before that catastrophe, there were small mammals, our own deep ancestors. I found one in Mongolia. There it is in the palms of my hand. It sort of splayed out. I took the skull off, tiny as a mouse. They did something with their anatomy that would also change the course of evolution. They loosened up the shoulder girdle. We carry it today. You can move your shoulder girdle all around. They did it for mobility at the size of a mouse. No one else would try a design so novel. And when scaled up, it gave their descendants an incredible range of gait. The ability to stick one foot out in front of another instead of in tandem. A suspension system that at high speed allows your head, your eyes, to glide across the ground, both prey and predator, flat as a board. Now, another group of animals that lived, we thought their heyday was before the extinction. It's still ongoing. They're like us. We're very unusual among mammals. They're bipeds. It was a bipedal radiation. They did not adjust and make their shoulder girdles mobile. They were, had these strong arms for them, actually, supporting their entire weight on their shoulder girdle was much less of a problem. In fact, um, we found fossils. That's one I found in China, Cynornis, little Chinese bird, to bridge the gap between Archaeopteryx, which we knew 150 years ago, at the time that Darwin penned his origin of species. We've now found a flood of intermediates from these beds in China and elsewhere. In fact, our questions now are not uh, really how flight was achieved as much as how many times it was achieved by these sturdy shouldered beasts. They laid eggs. They roamed the world. They did things with their bodies that we can only dream about. They take bone, tooth, and sinew to a level that we, we, we couldn't imagine without actually digging them up. And if I was going to take this on as a scientific problem, I figured I would start at the beginning. That's where I started, down in Argentina, foothills of the Andes. Um, this was a time and a place that preserved better than any other the very earliest dinosaurs. And that's where we found Eoraptor. In a couple of months, we're going to announce another one, the Dawn Runner. From this time period, dinosaurs were small, most of them. They were living in the shadows of mammals. But it was the beginning of a great radiation. And I've followed that radiation on drifting continents, one of those, Africa. To go into Africa, you need a spirited team. You have to become a very good manager. You have to find people, uh, and sometimes doctors and even photographers like Mike Ketwer, to follow you into the desert. This team, for example, excavated almost 100 tons of bones under conditions that you, can, you don't want to bring a thermometer like this. You'll never know exactly how hot it did get. Um, <laughs> You really rub shoulders with people of all sorts, really interesting ways of life, uh, as in these Tuareg nomads. Uh, you peer back uh, into time, uh, and really, it's just the most exciting thing to reach down and dig up these, these bones and put these skeletons together. It's a combination of science and art. They're really all the same. It's a big blur, uh, Afrovenator. And how about this animal? When you go out into a desert area and uh, pick up bones, from the surface, like this one, a thumb claw, 110 million years ago, and you're really the first to see this animal, your heart is beating a little fast. Here's a, Africa's answer to T-Rex, as big and probably more burly, Carcharodontosaurus on a cliffside in Morocco. Nigersaurus, a very bizarre Mesozoic cow, uh, from delicate fossils that were planed off through eons of time, laying out in the desert for someone to come and discover. We use a lot of different techniques today to put a, together a skull as delicate as Nigerosaurus. As you can see by the 
cranial bone in the bottom, you can shine a light through it. We use CT scans and others to see inside this Darth Vader-like skull uh, and actually print out its, its brain from the brain space inside the skull. There are the pink little loops, the ear region that told us that it held its head down, muzzle down to the ground and had a walnut-sized forebrain that was plenty good enough to uh, make its way uh, quite successfully 110 million years ago. My science is a science of evolutionary trees, a science that requires new methods to try, and, and some of them computerized to put together all this information to stretch it on a globe of, of drifting continents. It's really a four-dimensional problem, a very exciting one. We find various biological things about these organisms along the way. Here's a Mesozoic version of a macaw, a nut cruncher, uh, with a skull designed to, to crunch nuts. And here, a population, an actual Pompeii of dinosaurs, dozens of skeletons that got buried and stuck in a mud hole, giving us an actual population sample of a herd and literally tell us the direction they were going. You can learn something about their, a lot about their biology from finds like this. Or how about this? Twice as old as Tyrannosaurus, another find from Inner Mongolia, Raptor Rex, which by its proportions, this huge skull and tiny arms and fleet foot, we know that that Tyrannosaur design is not an accident of gigantism, but rather something that was a good design, as a matter of fact. Jaws on legs, as it were. Um, 125 million years ago that was scaled up 100 times to give us our favorite dinosaur here in North America. These are the evolutionary lessons writ large in the fossil record. We find flying forms, again, pterosaurs. We don't just go out for one particular life form. Uh, and huge things that uh, actually, on occasion, made lunch of the dinosaurs that, uh, that we dig up, like this, this pair of jaws. I brought a cranium outside that maybe many of you have seen. It's 110 million years old. It, the cranium that belongs with the jaws of this animal. And this is super croc. Um, when you see a skull this size, you perforce must go and look at the living animals to even understand something as basic as to what it was eating. And in fact, I mean, I how big it was. Here. We had to measure when living crocodiles, the biggest the among the them. Quarry. They see that it's as long as their boat. Yeah, set of chompers. Yeah, he's a big one. If they can just land it, this croc will provide useful data, helping Paul in his quest to understand Sarcosuchus. We're down in Costa Rica looking at the largest crocs. It falls to Paul to cover its eyes. Watch out, watch out. No, 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 no. Go on, you're going to have to get on the back legs. Yeah, yeah, sure. I got the back legs. You have a back leg? No, you have the front leg, my friend. I've got it. I got the back leg. Somebody get the front legs. He's the tallest. Yeah, let's get this tape measure on him. Whoa. Right there. Wow. 65. Wow. That's a big skull. Big, but less than half the size of Super Croc skull. We got a 14 foot crack. <laughs> I knew it was big. No matter what he does, don't, don't, don't get jump. off. I'm not, you don't get off. Don't worry about me. Paul has his data, so they decide to release the animal back into the river. <laughs> no, 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 don't get off, don't get off, don't get off. No, we're getting off. Don't get off. Get, get those legs off the ground. Paul has never seen a fossil do that. <laughs> okay, when I say three, we move. Yeah, one, two, three. Whoa. <laughs> so. <laughs> when I watched that, I... That sequence, I, I realize there's another philosophical question about what it means to count to three. It's really, <laughs> there was different ideas about that. But we were able to actually show uh, and predict how crocodiles scale with sizes and different skull shapes and eventually recreate, as you see here, uh, this 40-foot crocodile. It's really amazing. We learned a lot about crocodile biology. We learned they live beyond 50 years by sectioning their bones. There's so much to understand. And, and then, of course, there's Super Croc's friends. Here's 
dog crock. Uh, how did it, you know, how did it move? Again, another chance to, to, to try to look to living animals uh, and actually go out and get some high speed footage of the only living species that fortunately, as an adult, still gallops. Ours definitely was upright, and this freshie in Northern Australia uh, gave us a lot of clues as to what these animals were doing and opened up a whole new vista on, on, on crocodile evolution. An amazing uh, animal that can both wiggle its body in locomotion, vertically and horizontally, something fundamental that crocodiles did about 200 million years ago, and it's held them in good stead ever since. You know, we also found other things. We found uh, uh, the greatest archaeological site in the Sahara while looking for dinosaurs and super cracks and other kinds of things, and formed a team to go out and explore the people that lived in a green Sahara, starting about 10,000 years ago to about the time that the first pyramids were built. The Nile Valley, the lower Nile Valley, was not the place to be. It was too wet. Instead, it was a string of green oases that crossed, crisscrossed the Sahara. And the people living there have never really been found. Their burials, their jewelry, their customs, how they managed actually food supply. In fact, someone in talks related to this, in fact, these people actually managed reasonably large populations in the middle of the desert without domesticated animals and plants. Thought it couldn't be done. It was done in the middle of the Sahara with a water supply. This is a, an amazing burial of three people, a uh, woman and two children, very, very symbolic. Flowers, evidence of pollen underneath, and amazing series of things that we're finding uh, out in the desert. One thing is sure, when you go into the desert or you go out somewhere else, a cliff top, go to Tibet, you'll find something that you least expected. My life didn't start out as a scientist. I started out actually as a failed student for most of my career. Real difficult time in school. I was learning my science out of school, collecting butterflies, leaves, and the like. I ended up reading a dictionary, getting into college, becoming an artist. I found myself in art. That's my first painting on the left in high school. Studied art in college. And as part of the reason why I and, and uh, co-founder Gabrielle Lyons started Project Exploration about 10 years ago as an experiment, what if we could take kids and really let them experience some of what you're experiencing here today? Get up close and personal with a scientist or science. Take the average lot, the poor performers like me or others. Take some good students as well, but make sure that you keep track of them. That's what we did at Project Exploration. We decided that it was a long-term relationship that we needed with a kid. Understand where that kid came from. Not an anonymous figure, as good as it is to come in your door of a museum and out the other door, and as valuable of an experience as that is. We wanted to know where they came from, who their friends were. Did they have parents? What did they, what turned them on? What was curious for them? And in after school and out of school time, we felt we could make a difference, and the difference is dramatic. There's very little data like this, but this is 10 years of data just brought together now for project exploration. Because it's not enough to get kids excited about science. I think we could get any of you excited with a six-foot crocodile skull. We want to keep them excited and then give them the tools to actually pursue that excitement because we are in an information age. It's an age which does require a lifetime of education. And uh, the results, we take Chicago kids that are statistically average and take a 50, 52% graduation rate to a 96% graduation rate in after school through programs like Sisters for Science. Many of them are pursuing STEM careers. We try to get under their skin. Yes, let's give them a hand. <laughs> There's some of them here today. It's Gabrielle Line on the right. Uh, responsible really for the architecture. Our dream, if you ask me a dream, uh, a wish for, uh, for my Ted wish, my Ted wish would not be to find another dinosaur or crocodile. I've got a lot of those under my belt at this point. My wish would be to start here in Chicago the first youth science center, a neutral ground, a youth science center that would be really owned by the community where scientists like you see among the many of us talking here today, would come to share their discoveries. We have taken kids along on all of our announcements and so on, and it makes a dramatic difference. There's gonna be some initiatives in TED, we applaud those. We want to be the model that actually is spread. We can only serve hundreds and then eventually thousands here in Chicago, 
but we can be, ultimately, the national model uh, to show how, uh, in an urban setting, and we have this problem, why, why do this? There are lots of frightening statistics uh, that we have seen. It is extremely urgent, but not so much only because our destiny depends on it, but because it is the right of all the kids to experience some of what you've, the excitement of what you've experienced today so they can realize it in their own lives. Thank you.